Today's August 7th, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 52. It's all about the French Human Factors news today. We'll be covering some stories from DARPA's uh, about their science bullshit detector, uh, as well as dealing with robot co-workers. You know what? Human Factors Cast is the only podcast that can travel from L.A. to San Francisco in 30 minutes or less, and it starts right now. Let's do it right now. Right, right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome, and can't hit a cue on time. And I'm joined today by my good friend of yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on, Nick? How are you today? Hey, I'm good. I can't hit a cue. Human Factors Cast uh, starts all right. right now. All right. We got more than one cue this day. <laughs> we do. And also on the show, we're happy to welcome back Mr. Woodrow Gustafson. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me again. Hey, there he is. Okay, so Woodrow, last time you were on the show, you had just bought a house. You were very excited about it. What's been going on since? Uh, well, I've learned that... Uh, uh, installing stuff and, and using instruction sheets uh, are is not an easy task. So so you're using like what like IKEA instruction? Um, <laughs> sort of, sort of. Yeah, I, I mean not IKEA stuff, but um, a lot of it's like shelving and stuff like that for garage. And um, yeah, I, I I tried to put some up yesterday, and it took me about two hours to put some up. That should be thirty minutes. It yeah. was it was embarrassing. There's a whole field of like UX of. Uh instructions i feel that's out there because i mean like uh, th- there's some like nuances with that stuff that's like you know y- you have to pay attention to arrows or or whatnot and if you get it wrong then like you've totally messed up the whole thing well and, and you know i was thinking about it today too and i actually was able to install it completely upside down and it fit oh, together no. and and how does that happen i mean how can you design a product that can actually work and be, be able to be put together upside down. It just, uh, it's amazing. Now, was it functional when it was upside down, or did you have to redo it, the whole thing? Well, no, it actually was functional, but it not until I went to add, like, the final thing. And then I realized I, I installed it upside down and had to take it all apart again. Um, so that was oh, a little fun. bummer. Yeah, that, those are bad instructions for you. Holy cow. Blake. Yeah, Blake. it might have been a little bit of a user error, but um, I'm going to blame it mainly on the instructions. <laughs> Hey Blake, what's, <laughs> we'll give it to you. What's, what's been, up, man? What's been going on with you since last week? Oh, you know, it's just another wonderful Irish morning out here in Ireland. But nothing, nothing too big, Nick. I've uh, I've been playing a lot more of mobile games while I've been out across the pond because I don't have like a system or anything on me. I'm not really big on PC. Um, and you know, I remember playing Magic: The Gathering a long time ago on like Xbox when it first came out. And I swear they have not updated the UI in the least bit for any of their iOS or Android apps. The, the gameplay is the exact same. And I just figured I'd throw this out there that like doing a competitive analysis for products is the way to go these days. Because companies like Hearthstone by Blizzard and all that stuff have the gameplay so down that you would think that, that Magic the Gathering want, would want to compete with them, but man, it is nowhere near the tier of Hearthstone. Well, I mean, look, so Hearthstone is a pretty, a fairly, fairly simple to learn game, and I mean, I, I feel like Magic has a lot of complex systems going on, but that being said, there's still a lot to be said about, you know, doing a competitive analysis, and there's a, there's a dime a dozen card games out there right now, and some of them do some things great, and some of them do other things great, and, you know, being able to see what the competition does, I, I'm sure would would help it out oh yeah it's it's just it's not even down to mechanics of play because i totally agree with you right like some of the stuff is a lot more complex than you've ever seen hearthstone but this comes down to basically just visual presentation um and being able to like read these complex cards or whatever so it's just one of those things i don't know i'm big on doing competitive competitive analyses of different products if i'm gonna help a company like change their experience or anything like that so it's just something i thought of um, but Nick, what has been going on with you, man? Well, quick follow-up to last week. So last week I talked about the UX of RNG a little bit, and uh, 
Seems as though the UX gods listened to Human Factors Cast because literally right after last week's show, I uh, I got what I needed. Um, I also so I want to talk about Fortnite. Have you guys heard about Fortnite? A little bit. I have because I'm a big Epic Games fan, and I'm interested to see what Nick's got to say about it because it doesn't look good. So well, so let me okay. All right. Yes, in the notes I have, Fortnite is a UX mess, but let me explain. So, <laughs> so, so okay, so Fortnite, uh, for those listeners who don't know, Fortnite is a video game where it kind of mixes uh, Left 4 Dead with Minecraft elements and um, and a little bit of, of shooter, right? So, so uh, for people who don't play any of those games, it's kind of like a build a fort, and protect it against zombies that come at you, right? And um, while the actual gameplay is great, there are a ton of different systems in the game that are like, upgrade this thing and select one of 50 things for this thing and then upgrade that thing. And then you have a skill tree and then you have another skill tree that operates independently from that other skill tree and once you get through those skill trees then you unlock more skill trees and as a new player this is completely overwhelming and i spend more time managing sort of you know everything else trying to understand what's going on in the game more more than actually playing and it's really frustrating to me because i got kind of tricked into playing this game by a couple of my friends who said it would be a good time and and, uh, you know, and, and then I'm upset that it'll be free to play next year. So I hear and I paid $40 for it for early access, which early access is a whole nother thing. Ugh, I could go on about this, but uh, I'd rather not. But <laughs> oh, man. Well, it sounds like that that complex system deal is typical of those kind of like build as you play games then like fending off zombies but that's nuts about the skill trees and i don't don't know about you but in most games that drives me insane because i don't really like to do a whole lot of researching to build characters i like to be able to like just intuit it from the system that they're putting into play so i totally feel your pain there i mean it's not so much oh go ahead i was gonna say real quick uh you know what you need is you need a uh someone needs to build an ontology um for all that as like a quick reference guide yeah you know it's it's not so much the um the skill trees that are the problem. It's the fact that there's skill trees that lead into other skill trees and the relationship between two completely separate systems. There's th- this game suffers from system bloat. Like this is literally uh. a ton of different systems trying to work together. There's a ton of different aspects and there, I, I feel like there's zero synergy between them or it's so hard to understand what the synergy between these systems is that it's hard for me to play, you know, because I, I am one of those players who will sit down and be like, oh, how do I optimize, right? I'm a min-maxer. And so I'll sit down and I'll be like, okay, well, if I plan out my path this way, that will impact my gameplay in other areas. And there's just, I don't get that big picture with this game. There's so many systems. And it's, because it's an early access, you know, there's some, um, there's some issues that sort of, there's there's text that references older versions of the game that they haven't quite combed through and so like one of the tutorial quests has me go to this certain part of the game and then you know all the font or all the, all the text is different so like i i can't follow the instructions on the quest because they've completely redesigned it. and it's it's in early access so i'm trying to give it the benefit of the doubt i'll keep playing uh if only to give it a fair chance but uh yeah Sorry to sorry to say it's it's a little bit of a UX mess UX mess behind the scenes, but uh, who knows? Hopefully, you'll see improvement over the next couple of months because it is early access. It was forty bucks. I mean, it's just I don't know. We'll see. I hope to hear better stuff, or I'll maybe I'll hop on PS4 and play it with you and Billy. Okay, yeah, let's do that, and we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll make an event of it, and it'll be good time. All right, well, let's go ahead and move into uh, Human Factors news. Because this is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Now, this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, or none of it, really. I mean, as long as it relates to... I mean, let's be honest, folks. Today is French Human Factors. Uh, as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, which I feel like the stories this week are pretty fair game. Uh, Blake, what's up first? What do we got up first this week? 
All right, so this one's really cool. So Adam Russell, an anthropologist and program manager at the Department of Defense's Mad Science Division, DARPA, laughs at the suggestion that he's trying to build a real, live bullshit detector. The quite serious call for a proposal that Russell's just sent out on DARPA stationery asked for people for ways to determine what findings from the social and behavioral sciences are actually true. DARPA's asking for a system that can solve one of the most urgent philosophical problems of our time, and that's how do you know what's true when science, the news, and social media all struggle with errors, advertising, propaganda, and the worst of all, lies. No one really knows what an answer will look like, but the RFI is open until mid-August, and there's still uncertainty about funding, but hopefully science can, you know, fix, well, science, with some help from DARPA. So, guys, this is all in our wheelhouse of how do you deal with this kind of thing, because this is talking about the validity of science. So, what do you guys think? Man, I think this, it's really unfortunate that we need this. It's sad that we're at a point where we, no, it's not sad. It's, wow, I am so, I have so many thoughts on this. I can't even contain, I can't even organize them correctly. It's like, it's like the UX in Fortnite. Um, <laughs> well, honestly, okay, <laughs> let's, let's break this down in three pillars, right? So we have science, we have the news, and we have social media. And I feel like each one of these has its own problems associated with it. And trying, so, so it sounds like they're trying to, to create this blanket bullshit detector that will sort of sift through these things and kind of pull out the truth and pull out the not truths. I don't know. I, 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 I tend to think that the solution is more from the, well, let's fix science. Let's, let's fix this need to publish work and publish work leads to tenure and all that stuff. Let's, let's just publish what we find and not have this sort of societal value placed on finding something significant. You know, I, I, hate, I hate the whole p-value thing. If you find something, whether or not it's significant or not, it should be reported, right? I don't know. So that's, that's from the science yeah. side. And then there's this, the, you can fix news in a variety of ways, and you can fix social media. And I'm rambling I'm I'm curious what you guys think. Yeah, it's uh, you know I'm I'm kind of interested in it just from a uh, psychological background. Um, you know I think it's uh, it, I'm not a I'm not a big social media person, so I uh, you know I think I think uh, you know people really um, you know take take what people post for for um, for truth and. You know, even you know all these articles that keep coming out about how uh, how some of these journal articles are just uh, you know pretty much made up um, just to get the the grants and the funding is is uh, really tough. You know, um, especially as a scientist, when you're going through and reading these things, it's hard to tell. You know, are these real? Um, so I think right. I think you know if the, if this could um, you know work out i think it it could really help but how they do it i have no idea but that's why it's darker right yeah well i mean it's called for proposals so i mean we'll see what people come up with and yeah and blake what do you got yeah i mean it's uh it's interesting because I, I i think it's kind of strange this is my opinion i think it's strange how they throw news and social media in here and i'm and i mean i get the the connection but for me those two things you just have to be I don't know, on your P's and Q's and have a critical thinking cap about you when you read any of it. And if you're taking it all at face value, I, I, I don't really know um, what can be done about that. I think that's a personal person by person basis thing. Um, Nick, something you said about science is, is definitely my th rings well with some of the thoughts I have on it. I mean, that I think there is a big institutional problem that exists in science and universities today and that you're just you're basically fighting for your job and every paper needs to have some kind of P value hacked out of it or show something statistically significant. And it's, it just doesn't necessarily lead to a, a good train of science. I mean, going through this article, I'm, and I'm not specifically sure if it's psych studies they're looking at or if it's social sociology studies, but they make a point that there was 
Like if you string a bunch of papers together on a specific behavioral topic, let's call it like throw an example out there of like situation awareness sure. and you go through all of them, you might be more confused about what this construct is or approaches to measuring it than you were before and not even be able to string anything together. And I see that being the big problem with science, right? But it's, it's kind of the, it's the, it's the need for a creativity in solving the problem. Cause it's, it's hard to quantify some of these more, I don't know, abstract constructs that we're talking about with behavioral science. So sure. I, I wonder what they'll, what they'll do in terms of proposals they'll get from this RFI. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see what people come up with, but, um, you know, especially for our, I mean, li- our listeners who are in, in the field, I'm, I'm happy we're like highlighting this and who knows, maybe there's somebody listening out there who just has an awesome idea for a bullshit detector or, or some mechanism by which, you know, these institutional problems could be solved. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I cut you off there, Blake. What were you going to say? Well, it, it was funny because I was as I started the article, I almost like just stopped myself in the first paragraph. And I was thinking, well, maybe just machine learning and algorithms can solve a lot of these problems. But it goes on throughout the article to talk about basically the difference between problems you're solving with computer science versus these very hard to even quantify behavioral constructs. And that's something that you can't actually teach a machine if we can't even define it itself. So I think that's where really the problem lies. Um but I don't know. I'm interested to, to know if there's even a way you could put a BS detector to science. Um, but who knows? Maybe DARPA will come out with something we never expected. Yeah, I I, I strongly think that this is deep-rooted in the uh, institutions in which this, this stuff happens, right? So the, the spread of information um, from science to news to social media, there's obviously a relationship there, right? from science the news grabs it and then social media runs with it and i think that i don't know the, i'm i'm going to give somebody a free proposal here so fix fix the whole thing with science yeah just do that and then with the with the news get get somebody unbiased to do the news uh and report the facts okay great get that done and then social media stop people from from posting bullshit in the first place and uh you know, you you may have to exercise um, some sort of power over people's First Amendment right, and does that apply on uh, on social media sites? You know, if if uh, if they take down that that bullshit before it even spreads, like I don't know, like do you have a right to to spread bullshit? I I don't know. We're getting into like all these philosophical uh, arguments, and I I just don't know where any of it fits i i know one way of of ending uh all the the stuff that gets spread on social media you get rid of social media yeah (laughs) oh man (laughs) yep that's that's it that's it we solved it all right where's (laughs) our money we're done where's our money darpa all right blake what do we got up next all right, so you remember the third-party controller that your sibling, cousin, friend made you use when you visited their house in the NES days? Oh, yeah. Do you remember the pain you felt when the joystick wasn't quite right and they were hosing you on Mortal Kombat while you were busy trying to figure out why your character kept kicking? Damn you, Mad well, Cats. But yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. How'd you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, the All Controller isn't like that at all. The All Controller is a third-party project that, in theory can be used on any console. You can set up macros and speed buttons and connect to Xbox, the PS4, or the Switch. It also has a 40-hour battery and can connect to PCs. Uh, the Kickstarter is raising about $60,000 and is halfway there with a team aiming to ship in March 2018. Now, this this is super exciting to me because there is one reason that I don't play any, like... A lot of PS4 games or P- PC games, so that's because I'm in love with the Xbox controller. Now, I'm wondering if this one's good enough, or I like it enough, if that would allow me to pl- want to play, or make me want to play across platforms, but who knows? Mm-hmm. We'll see if they ship in March 2018 and see how it goes, but do you guys have any thoughts on this one? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, all I can say is I do have an Xbox controller, and I 
use it all the time for my PC. I mean, they obviously do have that technology now. Um, so to me, it doesn't seem like it's that far of a stretch to be able to um, get it to work on other other uh, platforms, you know. Because um, there are some games that I love. I, I love PC because there's so many different uh, buttons and, and shortcuts that you need. But then others that, like, like one of my favorites, and you guys are going to laugh, but Farming Simulator. Man, I love that game. Um, dude, I'll, I'll go farming and, and drive my tractor all day with my uh, Xbox controller. Yeah, yeah. No, I think so. So I, I got, yeah, I got a piece of bad news for you, Blake. This controller actually uses the DualShock 4 sort of uh, uh, joystick placement. So it's a. Uh, oh, bummer. I know. I'm definitely I, off of it. <laughs> so look, here's the thing. I, I'm on PlayStation 4 because I, my friend group is on PlayStation 4. And, uh, but I love, I, I, I love the offset. Um, thumbstick on the xbox controller right and yeah. there's there's a lot of like ergonomics with it where you have this offset where uh it almost can keep your wrists straighter when you're using that one i don't know uh i would have to consult with our ergonomics expert who happens to be here um <laughs> but uh so so I, I i just like the feel of it better but the the problem is you know there's only specialized controllers for the PlayStation 4 that allow me to do that or there's roundabout ways that could do it. And so if I had this, um, presumably if it had, you know, the offset controller, it would be perfect because then I could use it on whatever and I wouldn't have to get used to any other controller and I could just use this. And I think one of the pieces that we're kind of um, hovering over here is that Th that this has macro support and so you could enter a button combo as a macro and imagine never having to do the konami code again because you theoretically can hit all those all, that whole button combination with one button now so for fighting games i mean you have like an instant win right here so there's the whole ethics of can you use this obviously not in <laughs> tournaments or whatever but amongst your friends you could definitely pull some party tricks oh for sure and i mean I'm, I know I was kind of bashing because if it's going to use the, the dual shock, it's less appealing to me. But still, I mean, I, it would be worth it just to give it a shot to see, get used to it. And then across anything that I would play, which would be Xbox, PS4, or PC, like not ever having to adapt to a different controller, that would probably be worth it. And then like you're talking about it, you, if you can set up macros and speed buttons, eh, I'm pretty much all in if I can just get used to it. Oh yeah, and and you know you know what appeals to me too is because I've got so I've got two Xbox controllers. I keep one at my TV and then one at my PC, and they don't switch back and forth because they're paired to the devices. So it would be really nice, which I'm sure this exactly does, is you can choose which one you want to play at what time, um, which you can't really do unless you resync it. Um, so that's you know if they if they have that on there, then I can definitely see it being worth it. Oh yeah, no. It'll be. Uh, I, I hope. I mean, we've we've started to see this trend, right? Where a couple weeks ago we had this uh, this VR headset that that could be used on any platform, um, and it, it kind of just switched modes, right? And we're starting to see this trend where um, even in even in uh, the 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 gaming industry, uh, or, or I guess especially within the gaming industry, where you have several several different platforms. Um, but like there there are devices that will allow you to plug any cartridge into this device uh for for like old school video games and be able to play it and um you know this is just one more step in that right direction to where we have ubiquity across all of our products where we don't really have to uh sort of get get used to something new or compatibility issues aren't a problem because this one thing can do it all right yeah, my big fear, I guess, is, and Woodrow kind of brought this to my attention with the pairing across different consoles, is I'm assuming you probably would have to just download some sort of driver for each one. But I know for, for Xbox, it can be a super pain in the ass to try and pair the thing with a controller if it gets out of sync. So if it if that continues throughout like different platforms, that might be a, a, a showstopper for them. So hopefully they've got that down pat. Yeah, I'm hoping what they do is they have just different profiles and you go on the controller and you say PlayStation and then it syncs to your PlayStation or whatever, you know, and all that stuff is saved. Um, so I don't know. 
Uh, it looks like there's an option for pair controller, and then you go either to console or computer. I'm looking at the Kickstarter video here, uh, and then you basically load a driver on your uh, controller, and you're you're good to go. So, all right. Uh, well, do we have any closing thoughts on this one? Because uh, it uh, it definitely keeps your wrist at a neutral position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you about that before we move on. So, so do you feel that the Xbox controller is uh, the more ergonomically superior, or I, that's a leading question? Which con- <laughs> that is a leading question? Bad which, science, sir. <laughs> yeah, that is bad science. Um, uh, bullshit, bullshit. Right over here. Um, okay, so um, which one do it's, you it's feel? More, I, I prefer it. It's more comfortable in my hands. Um, that doesn't mean it's it's more comfortable for everybody. Um, but I do know that they've done ergonomic studies on them. And the Xbox does keep it at a more neutral posture so that longer gaming sessions, you'll have less, um, less fatigue of the hands. Boom. All right. Well, I am switching to... Man, I just... I, I want that offset stick on the PlayStation 4 so bad. Okay. So anyway. so what what you need to do is just take it apart and swap the internals of the Xbox oh. into your PlayStation controller and then you're good. Oh yeah, yeah, that that'll do it. All right. <laughs> I just want to qu- do a quick thank you to all of our friends over at BGR, Fast Company and Gadget, TechCrunch and Wired for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, uh, you can follow us on social media for links to all the original articles as we find them. We post them up there for you so you can see what we're talking about this week uh, before they come up. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and get back to our golden boy, Mr. Elon Musk. Well, oh, I guess yes. his idea, his his legacy. Uh, your man, yeah, seriously. Okay, so just weeks after Hyperloop 1 demonstrated a working version of its le- levitating sled, the company has made another leap forward. This time, the startup has successfully tested the XP1 passenger pod, reaching speeds of up to 192 miles per hour, and levitating off the track as they accelerated. The XP-1 traveled for just over 300 meters before the brakes kicked in, and it rolled to a gradual stop, hitting a top speed of, again, 192 miles per hour. That speed puts Hyperloop 1's system a little bit of ahead of a Category 1 high-speed rail, which has a maximum running speed of about 155 miles per hour. Although it's not quite faster than Japan's bullet train, it's, this is truly only a fraction of the eventual goal of about 750 miles per hour, but it's clearly demonstrating a demonstration of the company's strength that it's developing its prototypes for real. Their next goal is to iterate on other engineering challenges, such as the airlock for getting passengers in and out of the transportation pod without breaking the seal. Well, I would surely hope they <laughs> fix the airlock before they get anywhere near 750 miles per hour. Oh, yeah. This is cool. But uh, but this is, in, I, I don't know, that 192 miles per hour is just nuts on a prototype just weeks after this thing is getting talked about. I, I just can't even believe it. Yeah, and uh, what are the dimensions on this tube? I I feel like uh, it's mentioned somewhere in the article. I'm looking for it now. It's mentioned somewhere, but I know the reference is it's oh, smaller in it's terms of point- height. It's uh, 8.7 meters long by 2.7 meters tall and 2.4 meters wide. So that's so the pod. Knows? That's the pod. The tube is 500 meters long. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, still, this is incredible. It, like, the future is here, and I honestly, I honestly believe that this will revolutionize uh, transportation, and it will present a whole slew of different challenges for transportation human factors. Oh, yeah. I mean, now we're talking about like putting airlocks on these pods that are going to travel at such speed. I can't imagine what the planning would have to be in order to get one of these operational because that's I would assume that's probably a pretty big risk to passengers if that blows. Well, it's not. So the reason they have uh, so it sounds really, really dangerous, but really it's just a matter of keeping that vacuum. Right. And if the vacuum doesn't keep, then it just doesn't travel as fast as, as efficiently. Fast. Yeah. So so it's really not a danger to travelers, but the whole like getting from LA to San Francisco in 30 minutes is going to change the way we see the world. Like I will no longer see that as an 8-hour trip. I will see that as a 30-minute afternoon 
like I can go to San Francisco and just hang out for the day and then come back. Like it will, it will completely collapse the way. Like I, I have a feeling that it will be similar to the way that airplanes kind of transform the world, right? Where now we can get from one place to another uh, much easier than we could have before, much quicker. This will do the same thing again. Yeah, my my only um, thing about this though is I'm I'm watching this loop that they have on the on the website. I, I want to see I want to see paths and stuff. I want to see an open, uh, not an open cage, but like I want to see what I'm passing. I want to see how fast it really looks going 192 while I'm passing trees and cars and oh whatever, sure whatever you know. Sure. And I mean, there, uh, I saw some concept you know, get designs, some plexiglass or something, you know, see, so I, I saw some concept designs where the tube was open. It was glass. You could see what's going on on the outside, but I also saw some concept art that would, um, be basically like an augmented reality, uh, presentation on the inside of the pod. Um, and I think it, it all comes down to engineering challenges, right. That they have with the tube and, and what materials work best for this. And, Honestly, man, right. you you won't care if you get to your destination in thirty minutes. If you have like some virtual representation on the inside that says, "Oh, look, I am passing," you know, um, the grapevine right now, and I'm passing, um, you know, I, I'm I'm this far up on the fight, like some sort of visual representation of where you are in relation to the two places. Right. Well, yes, I completely agree. I would love to see. I w- I would love to take that trip at uh you know 500 700 miles per hour what do they say they want to get up to 750 750 yeah wow that is crazy um but yeah i stick your head out the window (laughs) right come right off (laughs) uh um blake do you have any uh what do you think this will do for transportation human factors uh honestly i think it I think one thing it does it opens up the possibility for jobs, right? So you don't it doesn't necessarily mean you have to live and work in the same place anymore, especially with that kind of time like ex, express amount of time that you can go from LA to San Francisco. Um, I th- I wonder what it's going to be like when they start developing more prototypes that are closer to the real thing and how how that changes because you guys bring up good points with well what about being able to see outside well what if it's what if you're going 750 miles an hour which i don't know if any train or anything like this goes that fast what does that do to a a person physically when you're traveling in this like a basically tiny tube and would you be able to handle just staring outside um but also too you have a great opportunity to enhance things that you typically see in trains like maps or conductors with augmented reality for people to get used to it and, and interact with it. Um, so yeah, you I don't are, know, it brings up. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, go ahead. Woodrow. Oh, I was just going to say, you bring up a great point. I think, um, it would be really interesting for the perceptual aspect, right. Of, of trying to perceive if your system can actually handle seeing something going by you 750 miles an hour. I mean, yeah, yeah. That, I feel like you'd have to really pay attention to the, how people are going to react to doing that or sitting there or how they're strapped in or if they're not. So I have a solution yeah. to this, and uh, uh, my fellow Star Wars fans are going to love this. So they're halfway there with the blue lights on the interior of this tube. All they got to do <laughs> is make streaking white lights come at you, and then boom, hyperspace, and then you're good. <laughs> I would love to experience this and feel like I'm going through hyperspace. That would be... But for, but for 30 minutes straight... Oh my gosh! Yes, <laughs> thirty minutes. Woodrow, let me chaos. let me school you really quick. The Millennium Falcon took four hours to get to the Death Star or to the Alderaan system from Tatooine, right? So, so they were in hyperspace for four hours. All right. Wow. So yeah, but they could probably I, like lay down or something during that and fall asleep, take a nap. Read a book. Yeah, but I can handle 30 minutes, man. I could, dude, oh. I love the hyperspace <laughs> look. I could stare at that for hours. All right. Uh, this conversation has devolved to Star Wars talk, so I think it's time to move <laughs> on to the next one. <laughs> All right. So, as the world's most powerful computer systems begin to embrace artificial intelligence, the potential damage that a rogue AI could cause continues to grow. 
So many have theorized how an artificial mind could turn against its creators, and Facebook just got an interesting lesson in how such a scenario might unfold. So Facebook's engineers were forced to pull the plug on one of the company's AI systems after its bots began communicating with each other in a completely new language, which humans simply could not decipher. The AI bots were originally programmed to use plain English to communicate with one another, and they were found to be speaking what appeared to be gibberish. And without being able to understand how or why the bots were communicating, Facebook had no choice but to shut down the system. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the kind of dichotomous views that I guess Zuckerberg and Musk take on AI, but this is all too funny because Zuckerberg is really, oh, it shouldn't be any kind of restraints on AI, it'll be fine. And Musk has a much different point of view, much more of this doom and gloom, AI is going to talk to itself type of thing. So I think this is kind of ironic to see in the news. Is this not iRobot come to life? Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, without seriously. the three laws, right? Yeah. Right, it's close. exactly. It's the same thing. I mean, this happened. It's crazy. Hey, Blake, I, I have to admit, I'm a little disappointed you changed the show notes on this one because I was hoping that you would actually say the sentences out loud. I left those in there. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, I couldn't tell earlier. I was trying to cut them down. No, it's okay. Wordy, it's, but yeah. it's okay. It's okay. Uh, but just to go over the sentences, they were so th- they appeared to be gibberish, and these sentences came out something like, I can, can I everything else? And the other one re- would reply back, Balls have zero to me, 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 to Right? And they were just like saying all this gibberish, and they were basically communicating more effectively than they would have by actually describing the, um, by actually using the words. Uh, but yeah, scary. Yeah, which is just insane if you think about it. I mean, I don't, the problem is I really don't know what this system was built to do. It just, it really talks about it being an AI, AI bots that can communicate with each other, and they basically just built their own language that couldn't be deciphered. Yeah, sure. I mean, I would need to see a little bit more about what the circumstances surrounding this were. I don't think it's any cause for concern, really, because, you know, with um, with AI, the whole thing is learning. And if they learn to communicate better about this, whatever this thing was, right, like it shouldn't be scary because they wouldn't they wouldn't develop like they wouldn't say oh, let's kill all humans in this conversation, they would be trying to be like, let's order this guy pizza the most efficient way possible, and we can't do that by just common English. We need to devolve to um, you know, this, this binary representation through English that they have created. I don't know. Like AI sets out what you set it to do. So if you say, I'm going to make a bot that will order somebody pizza, and you make another AI that says, I'm going to be, I'm going to pretend to be a human that wants to order pizza. They will stick to those tasks and they won't deviate from them. And yeah, sure, the pizza AI that, that's pretending to be a human might go to me, to me, to me balls, whatever. And the other one will go, I can, I can everything else. And they understand that that means I want a pepperoni pizza with everything else or whatever it is. You know, I'm just, this, this situation is entirely hypothetical. But they wouldn't then go, oh, and by the way, do you want to kill the humans? Like, <laughs> it's not something to be scared about. It's, it's good that these AI systems were able to figure out a way to communicate more effectively because that just means that this whole interaction is going to be, um, you know, uh, quicker. I don't know. That's, that's sure. kind of how I see it. I mean, but I'll, I'll take a contrasting point to you then. I mean, this is... And most likely, this is a very kind of entry level thing for Facebook, right? Like they, they, whatever this system was, it was probably really simple. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we would want the machines to find the most optimal path and be as efficient as they can. And that does not, for them certainly, necessarily mean using plain English. The problem that I see, and it doesn't matter how minuscule this particular system was, is you have to, if they can, if the programmers can no longer understand what the robots are doing or what the AI tech is doing. If we start trying to integrate AI in between larger systems, like talking, like let's say talking between autonomous cars or systems that help run some of our 
our water cleaning facilities, that's when it gets a little sticky because now we've introduced AI bots that are doing their own thing and we can't decipher what they're doing. Um, sure. So I, I think it does at, su- at some point need some kind of touch from maybe the human factors world or certainly cybersecurity on, okay, how do you start predicting when these things are going to happen or what are we doing with our AI algorithms that are making them kind of deviate to a way we can't explain what they're doing and always building in that human backdoor um, for instances like this. That's fair. And I think we're highlighting two sort of different uh, schools of thought with AI, right? The one I'm highlighting is that um, we shouldn't be afraid because AI will not do anything that we don't program it to do unless we program them to say, you know, kill all humans then they will do exactly that and they'll find the most efficient way to do so. But if you program them to do something innocuous like buy a pizza or, you know, talk to other vehicles on the road or purify my water, if they do that, you know, with their own language that they've created up, that's fine. So, but then there's also the view that you're taking here, Blake, which is uh, we should be afraid, very afraid because, you know, who, if they, if they, are doing something like creating their own language, which is beyond their protocol, which was to clean the water, which was to communicate with other vehicles on the road, uh, then who knows what other evolutions can happen in that system. Yeah, it's more so being making sure that we, when we design these things, that there there's always a way for us to get into it. Because I, I feel like the ability of... AI to learn consistently and continually improve, it's just going to get exponential as time goes on. So we won't be able to necessarily keep up with what they're doing at all times. So I feel like building a design system around how we can always be able to intervene or having reporting systems that allow us to understand what's gone on or what or predict when these problems will happen will become key. Right. Woodrow, which, which train of thought do you subscribe to? Um, you know, I think, I think, um, the, the way it's going, I think, uh, you know, we can definitely, uh, learn from this and, you know, try to take these lessons learned and keep kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit at a time. Um, you know, and, and I, I don't know, it's, uh, I'm kind of torn on this because at one hand, I, I really would like to see some of this technology because I think it could really, enhance kind of our way of life but at the same time it is it's a little scary um when you kind of start losing control of a system because um you know like blake said you put it in charge of a you know would you would you trust it as as um um taking care of a nuclear plant system um you know how much trust would you really have in that so um yeah i don't know it's 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 a tough one yeah, I mean, to be fair, I mean, we already put a whole lot of trust in AI systems because, I mean, if you think about it, something like a PID um, equation is AI. It's reacting to stimulus and then reacting to itself in order to correct that stimulus. So it, just in the context of like a nuclear power plant and a PID is, right. um, oh, shoot, I forgot what PID stands for. It's like intensity, duration, and potency. I'm not sure. No, potency and intensity would be the same thing. I'm not sure. Somebody, you know what? Well, I'm going to look it up on the show. Go ahead, Blake. What were you going to say? Well, <laughs> well, even playing kind of devil's advocate to that, right? I mean, in nuclear power plants, there's the argument can be made that certainly a lot of the errors that occur are from human design, right? Like, there's, there's, I don't know about you guys, but there was a famous picture for, in my human factors class from one of the power plants in America that they had replaced all the knobs and dials with beer taps because that just made it easier for them to know what to do or they were they had a better idea of what they were, what the knobs did right um, so I mean a lot of human error will be taken away from adding AI and that's that certainly is why I would see myself as a proponent of it. I just think there's there needs to be more thought behind it than just letting it run free. Checks and balances, right. for sure. Uh, just to 
to stifle any incoming emails uh, <laughs> about PID controllers, proportional integral derivative controllers. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, yeah, I know, yeah, they're I'm, they're. I do not remember that. I know, right? It's silly me. Uh, they're a control loop feedback mechanism. So you know, as things feed into itself, it it uh, reacts accordingly. Um, okay, so we talked about AI. What's up next, Blake? I think this is our last story, right? It is, it is. All right. So this is a little bit of the kind of the good parts of AI, what it can bring us, how it's going to benefit you and I and everybody else potentially. So we already have an idea of what the future looks like because you are likely already working with bots or artificial intelligence and maybe even machine learning algorithms. They're increasingly being incorporated into everything from workstations to websites to cloud computing platforms. And futurists like Nicholas Badminton suggests that the deeper integration of technology in everyday work tasks is going to save time and improve the way you work. Your tech assistants will likely have organized scheduling and tasks in anticipation of the day ahead by the time you sit at your workstation. Quote, you'll probably be walk <laughs> you'll probably be going to walk into the office and your system's been churning over the last couple of hours considering what's been going on in business, your role, your job, what you need to do that day, and probably offer up several ideas about the right direction of what you should do in your workday. So, I mean, there's a great potential for robots and AI to ba basically make us more efficient as humans and remove a lot of that error we see in our everyday lives. I like this article. I think it goes, uh, it, it, it almost brings to light, like, oh, yeah, you're working with bots now, and in the future, they will automate your mundane tasks even more. Um, putting together all those metrics that you do every time you go out and do a user assessment, those will be automated. Uh, you know, and, and then you can focus on the analysis piece rather than the, um, you know, number crunching. So uh, I like it. I, I don't have a whole lot to say on it other than uh, it's, it's a good introspective piece to to kind of look at you know how how potentially the workplace could change yeah certainly i mean one of the things i thought was interesting is the is how hopefully with the changes in technology like for telecommuting and telepresence like robots that can display you and give you more of like kind of access to different audiences for remote teams. I mean, with how that technology grows and allows you to interact with more people across the world. And it mentions in the article, like somebody giving a keynote through a robot basically. And it didn't, they claim that wasn't there. I wouldn't know. They claim that this particular robot they used was able to really interact with the audience well enough that the speaker and the audience didn't really have a lot of loss of, intimacy in the conversation or anything like that so that that kind of introduction of robots into the world is always really interesting to me it, um it wasn't just a segue on on or a, an ipad on a segue <laughs> uh that's what it looks like for it sure does, Actually, it does it does you guys have seen the uh so bob's burgers episode where tina is in one of these that's exactly what it looks like you know i was going to highlight a couple other uh media pieces there's a South Park episode where I believe Cartman, or no, maybe it's Kyle, um, goes trick-or-treating with one of those things. And then there's also a Modern Family episode where Phil uh, goes with one of those while he's on vacation. So, good stuff. There's actually, I'll, I'll point one out too. There's oh, actually yeah. one on How I Met Your Mother um, in the last season. Oh. Uh, Marshall. Yes, uh, I do remember this. I, I know those for the podcast. <laughs> there you go <laughs> alright guys do we have any other closing thoughts on this because I want to get to our, our listener question get to oh, it man alright so instead of it came from reddit this week we're going to address some listener mail uh, so this letter comes from Zach Kearns so thank you so much for writing in Zach if you want to be like Zach you can always email us at uh, humanfactorscast at gmail.com or you can just do the uh, contact us on our website Zach writes, hey guys, I recently discovered your podcast after learning more about the human factors field. I'm trying to learn more and see if I can break into the field with a biomechanics and motor learning background with an MS and BS in exercise science. Would you have any advice for someone just learning about the field for the possibilities? 
My interest areas have been human performance in extreme environments like flight and space flight, and now I, I'm trying to pair that with technology. Uh, I have been reading some textbooks and a uh, and I'm helping with the design of a new user interface for a robot that I work with, which led me to your field. I'd agree, I would appreciate any advice or tips you guys may have. Also, I really enjoy your show. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Zach. Thanks again for writing in, Zach. Um, so, actually, this is the whole reason why I wanted Woodrow to be on the show. Obviously, to talk about the other stories, but uh, Woodrow is our resident ergonomics expert, and I know that's like the bane of his existence that... Uh, <laughs> But I, I pinged him about this earlier, and I said, you know, you just want to be on the show and talk about it. So uh, without further ado, Woodrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, Zach, I, uh, I really like your, your email. Um, I, I was talking uh, to Nick earlier today, and, um, you know, I was thinking about, about a few things. And um, depending on kind of what you, what you really want to go into, um, you do have a lot of options with the biomechanics background and motor learning. Um, you know, some of the things that kind of popped in my head um, immediately were uh, some companies like, um, you know, Human Scale or Ergotron. Uh, they make some some really cool ergonomic um, uh, products, work products. You know, um, chairs, desks, um, monitor arms. Um, but you, you know, you're you're talking more of the interest in human performance and extreme environments. Um, so that kind of got me thinking about actually exoskeletons. Um, and those are really starting to become uh, kind of popular nowadays. Um, and so I, I did a quick search and, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin actually has uh, an, an ergonomic um, division um, or an exoskeleton, sorry, exoskeleton uh, division that they're working on right now. And I know that the, the military is working on some exoskeletons oh, yeah. to allow... Um, you know, the, the uh, uh, military to, you know, increase the amount of weight that they can carry um, while decreasing the, uh, the, the, the weight on their body. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities in that area. It just, you just kind of need to figure out where, where you kind of want to go with it. But it does sound, you know, like you are doing some human factors work already. I mean, if you're designing an interface uh, for a robot, um, you know, that does have a lot of um, ergonomics and, um, well, not ergonomics, but a lot of human factors, um, uh, principles in it. So. Yeah. I just, so I want to, I want to piggyback on what you were saying and the whole extreme environments thing. I think there's a whole field of wearable technology, right? And I, I feel like wearable technology is a nice marriage between these two, two concepts that you seem to enjoy the whole human factors aspect as well as the ergonomics or biomechanics background, right? Cause you have to have something form fitting, uh, to the human body that has to be adaptable to many different types of bodies. And also, uh, you know, you have that technology aspect. You have the whole interfacing with this wearable technology. Now, this could be wearables on your arm to, you know, wearables on your head. Uh, whatever it is, you know, you can you can think of different ways to interact with these. And whether or not you have an interface on it, that's a whole other challenge. Now, I know these have been used in extreme environments, so... Um, or, or especially like uh, um, sensors, right? That they that can potentially have an app behind them, um, and and understanding some some of that app development uh, behind the scenes could definitely help out. Uh, if you, if you want to branch into the field of human factors, you have to kind of understand what where the sensor is going to be on the body and how it kind of fits to the body, and then also what the what the app behind it does. So there's there's a lot of things that you can do uh, in the field of human factors that kind of marry these two um, two passions of yours. I mean, th if this is a really great sort of uh, intersection of interests, and I'm glad you found the field, uh, Blake. What are you? Do you have any suggestions for Zach? Oh, surely. I mean, truly, this guy's got such a leg up. I mean, with a master's and bachelor's in exercise science, I mean, he obviously understands the ins and outs of the human body, which is important for if he wants to design for different, uh, like, see it, like he says, extreme environments. And I mean, if he's already designing UIs, like in the in the field of just exercise in general, I mean, you could build machine, you could build like weight machines and different uh, fitness apps I mean alone but if you're interested in because you, you talk a little bit about 
flight and space flight specifically. And I really encourage you as far as looking into flight and space flight, definitely looking at some of NASA Ames internships. Cause I, I get their newsletter every week and they've always got internships for either at Ames here in California or there in California or in uh, NASA Langley where it's designing wearables for space. Um, and if you're already working with robots, I mean, they're constantly throwing up like year long internships to work on different Mars rovers. And I believe it or not, you get a lot of um, availability for a human factors practitioner. So, and you have a unique background with this exercise science. So you really understand biomechanics really well. So I think you would have a really good shot at bringing a lot to the table, especially for space flight. Yeah. And from what it sounds like, you're, you're probably learning a lot from, um, designing this user interface for this robot. And so you're probably learning a lot about the whole human factor side of things too. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of great books that you can check on that. Uh, I mean, you, you can check out any of the human factors basics, right? Like design of everyday things. Um, don't make me think just all these basic, basic human factors, UX books, right. W- would probably help you out in terms of um, sort of applying uh, what you're what you're learning, but but human factors basically is 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 how does the human fare in this system? And uh, you know, I think um, if you can sort of understand how to test human performance, which background in exercise science, I think you're golden. Like uh, you you clearly know what you're talking about, and and I think uh, this is right up your alley. So, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one, guys? Yeah, uh, one book I want to throw out to him because uh, a lot of the human factor side or a lot of what you have to learn is methodology and one great book for methods that I used in master's school or whatever it was, was um, measuring human behavior by Tullus and Albert. And that basically outlines anything from if you're doing software or a physical product, how you test it, how you do it quickly, all those kind of good things. I can second that Woodrow. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to say one quick fun fact. Actually, I uh, know something Blake Blake mentioned. Um, I actually know somebody who has driven the Mars rover. Just That's pretty funny. That that fun fact. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. It might be the same guy. Um, All right, guys. Well, that's going to be it for today. Uh, let us know. Uh, what you thought of the news stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. Uh, if you think we missed anything, feel free to send us those. Uh, send us those, send those our way. Wow, I missed the intro and I missed this. This is awesome. <laughs> you can follow us on all over social media. <laughs> Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. It's been a great day, guys. Leave us a voicemail at 901-642-6... Wow, 646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Don't call 642. That's not right. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast because we bring these things to you ad-free and provide valuable advice like we did today for Zach. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course... You can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnstorf, where can our listeners find you? Oh, you guys can find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. Don't Panic UX and Mr. Woodrow Gustafson. Where can our listeners find you at? You can find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, everyone. It depends. Oh, it depends. It depends. Space fly. Hyperloop. Depends. Bullshit.